I flew back uh, last week. <laughs> All the days sort of get crowded into each other. <laughs> I think it was last week. Yeah, I arrived back on Wednesday night and I was just meeting with uh, Peter Lee, the executive minister who's responsible for... Uh, coordinating and ministering amongst all the different ministries of City Life Church. I was meeting with him in the morning and there's a knock on the door to say a, a call from my sister Sharon and it was to say that my mother had died that just uh, an hour or so before. Now we were expecting that to happen. I'd actually been with her three weekends before that over in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, we realized that she was uh, declining and she, it was expected that she would pass away relatively soon. So I'd had a really precious opportunity to be with her and to share with her and spend some last times together. Nevertheless, when you do hear that news, it still hits your heart a little bit. You just got to pause for a moment and grieve and for the loss. But she's, she's, she's with the Lord now and in a better place and so... Uh, immediately I flew over to Christchurch in New Zealand, spent some time with my two sisters and my brother just planning the funeral. It all went very smoothly. We had the funeral on Monday and that was a special moment of remembering all that my mother had contributed to our life. And because my mother is actually the last of that generation, my father passed away 10 years earlier. Uh, my aunt, my uncles, and my aunts, they, they, they had passed away as well and gone to be in, with the Lord in heaven. And so... Now that was really the end of a generation. Uh, my, my, my sisters and my brother and me, we recognise oh, we're now the older generation. That's a bit confronting, isn't it? <laughs> we're no longer the younger generation, we're the older generation. And so you have that added sense of responsibility as what's the legacy that we are going to pass on to the younger generations now that they've gone on and be to be with the Lord. So that's the title of the message I want to share today. It's on this whole area of legacy. What are we leaving for future generations. After the funeral on Tuesday with my two sisters and my brother, we had in my mother's unit, we had the that uh, responsibility of going through all the remaining things that she had. And she generally over the last five years, re recognizing she was getting older, she's 80, she was 89 years of age. And so we had received a lot of things and brought a lot of things back into Australia or gone to the various parts where my family lives around the world. Uh, but there was still a whole garage load full of things. And there was this big old trunk you know those metal trunks they used to have many many years ago a big metal trunk full of stuff for me I mean I found a pair of little tiny gum, gum boots that I used to wear when I was only three four years old there was a there was a uh, jumper the one of those vests you know without the sleeves that she had knitted for me when I was about the same age and all this was stored away very lovingly by my mother in this huge trunk it was like a legacy that she was leaving for me including a scrapbook I thought I'd got all the scrapbooks, but there was another scrapbook in there where she'd accumulated all the cards that she'd had, and there were cards, and you know, at a time like this when my mother's passed away, but the whole generation is going, there's, you were remembering our whole family, I'm remembering my dad on Father's Day, and for Father's Day coming, and here are cards from my mum and my dad, and cards from my aunts and my uncles, all expressing their love for me. Here's one of them, they, that my mum and dad gave me. Uh, just after my teenage years, I think it was on my 20th birthday or so. And this is what it says on the front. Son, we cannot remember one moment of trouble or worry you ever gave us. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? What an angelic child I must have been. <laughs> and then I opened it. I'd forgotten about this card. Anyway, what it says on the inside is, of course, you must understand that as people grow older, the memory does begin to fade just a bit. <laughs> Happy birthday with love from mum and dad. And, you know, it's one of the things I loved about my mum and dad. We could have a good laugh together. And I know as a teenager, I gave them a hard time. There were things that uh, <laughs> they needed to forgive me for. In fact, that's one of the legacies that my mum and dad gave me is the heart of love and forgiveness that they extend to you. And uh, those of you who have teenagers, you know, I was a pretty morose teenager. And if you are teenagers here, God bless you. I know you're, you're on a journey. We're all on a journey. And we love that. We love the younger generation. But nevertheless, it's a gift of love and a gift of forgiveness and a gift of patience and a gift of forbearance and a gift all that we need to pass on to that generation. And we're practically doing here on Father's Day and on Mother's Day and all through it for fathers and mothers and spiritual mums and dads and uh, aunts and uncles and those who are cousins. You know, and we all have that responsibility to pass on a legacy of love and forgiveness and patience and kindness to the generation which is coming and will carry that on into the future. So I want to talk about legacy today. I want to talk about this whole area. What are we passing on to future generations? Here's a great scripture. It comes from Proverbs 13, 22. 
A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And you think about that, it's for your children's children. I think when it, without, it's easy to make a plan for what you might hand on, materially speaking, to your children, or even immaterially in terms of our own values and the things that we, you know, are important to us. You can, you can work towards that. You can plan towards that. How do you hand on something to your children's children when you might not even be around? There's quite a confronting verse there. Is it possible to actually hand on something which goes beyond just one generation but goes on to another generation and then another generation and another generation? I believe it is. I believe it's possible to leave a lasting legacy which is not just what you hand on to our children but which continues on generation after generation after generation. If you think about it, I thought that movie Gladiator, a bit of a confronting movie, but uh, nevertheless, there's some great lines in there where Maximus Decimus Aurelius, or Maximus Aurelius Decimus, this gladiator who used to be a commander in the Roman army, he makes this comment, you know, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. There's a very real sense in which the things that we do in this life, they have eternal quality, they have eternal value, they create a ripple effect. And that ripple effect might not be remembered by future generations, but nevertheless it has an influence for good or an influence for evil, depending on what the legacy is that we leave. We are eternal beings, for a start. Every one of us is an eternal being. When we die, we have, there's an afterlife. We go to be with, with God if we're a follower of Jesus Christ. And all of those things that have been a part of our life are held in God's heart and God's mind, and they continue on. And what is it, the legacy that we are reaping for our own life, what is it, the legacy for eternity that we are passing on to others? It's a confronting thought, but it's a good thought. It's an even a good thought to have on Father's Day for fathers and for mothers and for aunts and uncles and spiritual mums and dads. What is the legacy that we're going to pass on to our children's children? For some of us, that might be even more confronting because the legacy we've received from our fathers and our mothers and from the generations, our forebears that went before, might be a very painful Legacy, And I'm not saying even for me, you know, there's painful elements in the life journeys that you've been in and what my, my father and mother, grandparents and all that went through. There's painful elements. For some of you, those may be particularly painful and Father's Day may be a very confronting day. Mother's Day early in the year may be a very confronting day when you are reminded of some of the pain of your own ancestry and the pain of your father and your mother and, the, and what the losses you might have experienced. Greg Vaughan in a book... Letters to Dad writes about this. Uh, he writes about his own experience when his father died. And he was going through, a few days later, his father's garage. And he'd never, his father had never really spoken words of love to him, had never actually expressed love to him. There was nothing written down that he knew of, that is, his father had never given him birthday cards. His father was a fisherman, and he'd go on fishing trips, but he never actually took Greg on those fishing trips with him. And Greg came to a point where he was going through the garage and he found a tackle box, a fishing tackle box, in which when he opened it up, he discovered there were some dried crusty old worms and some rusty old hooks and some fishing line. And this is what he writes in his book, Letters from Dad. Finding an old box of fishing tackle in my father's garage, I blurted out to God, this is it? <laughs> this is all that I get? I don't even get my father's signature. See, there was nothing that his father had written down to him out of any period or era of his life and journey with his dad to express love to him. And then, just as that happened, because Greg was a believer in Jesus, Greg felt God say this to him. Now, sometimes in life, not regularly, sometimes it's hard to discern what God might be saying, but there, there's sometimes in life, if we're a follower of Christ, when we just really sense by the power of the Holy Spirit, God is speaking something very real to us. And that's what happened in this tragic moment for Greg. He felt God say to him, I've got a question for you, Greg. If you were to die today, what would be in the tackle box of your life? What a, what a confronting question. What would be in the tackle box of my life? What would, be in the what, would be in this, what would be left behind that I'm passing on to other generations? Greg continued to reflect on what God said to him. And he felt God say to him, what would your children hold in their hands tomorrow that would let them know there are treasures in your life? And it brought quite a change in Greg's life as he reflected on that. Because I do really believe that whatever our past may have been, whatever the legacy we have, may receive from our fathers and our mothers and our forebears, 
we can start a new generation. We can begin anew. We can start again. And we can leave a new legacy to our children and to our children's children. It's possible. It's possible for that to happen. In fact, we can see it regularly in the Bible as we reflect on the scriptures. Now, this is not a day when we're going to do a big theological study on inheritance, but I do want you to know that inheritance is a theme that goes right through the scriptures, right from Abraham. Remember, Abraham, we don't know what his family background was, and his father didn't come from any believing in a single monotheistic God, so there might have been quite brutality and viciousness in his family background. And so Abraham, though, began a whole new generation, and he passed on the promises of God to his children and to his children's children. And then as we continue on and we read through the scriptures and all the heroes of the faith, which we heard about a few months ago now, we hear about their lives, we recognize that there are men and women who passed on a legacy to their children and to their children's children. And yet at the same time, there are times when the people of Israel fell away from God and turned away from God, and the legacy that was passed on by kings and by queens and the various rulers of Israel and the various people of Israel was actually a legacy of violence and a legacy of tremendous abuse. And so we see this whole thread of both these two things happening, both a positive legacy but also a negative legacy happening right through the scriptures. But there's this continuous thread right through the whole scriptures where God calls his people back to him and calls them back to a new beginning, calls them back to a new start where God is wanting to restore to them the promises of God and restore to them their inheritance and restore to them the legacy that they, a positive legacy that that they can pass on to their own children and to their children's children. One example of that, of these prophetic words that are spoken to the people of Israel, calling them back to a new destiny, is in the book of Joel. I just want to turn to it at the moment. I've read a number of different translations of these. None of them quite fully capture... Uh, I I like different aspects of the different translations. So the one coming up on the screen will talk about, I will restore to you. I love that word restore. And there's a prophetic word. God is a God of restoration. He is a God who will restore. Here in the uh, NIV translation, it says, I will repay you for the years that locusts have eaten. And then it clarifies what these things are. Here it talks about the destroyer and the cutter. Well, each one of those is actually a word in the Hebrew language which describes like a flying insect. And it may actually be the different stages of the locust as the locust goes through different stages in its life cycle. So here in the NIV it says... I will pay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts, the young locusts, the other locusts, and the locust swarm, my great army that I have sent among you. You God can restore, even though we've experienced famine, even though we've experienced violence, even though we've experienced abuse in our life. God can restore. He is a God of restoration. He will repay when we come to Christ and when we come to our Lord and our Savior. There is a change and transformation that happened, and we can start a new generation. It continues on there in Joel. It's not up on the screen there, but let me just read a little bit to you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then it continues in verse 28. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Now, if we've been students of the scripture, we'll recognize that prophetic word. And here in Joel, it's saying afterwards, but do you know that this has already happened? The inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, yes, it's for eternity. Yes, it's there when we're in heaven with Jesus and when we receive a new body and a new destiny. But that inheritance, we receive a down payment already. That inheritance has already begun. Eternal life has already begun. Restoration has already begun. The restoration has begun in Jesus Christ. Because when we come to Jesus Christ, we read in the book of Luke how Jesus stood in the temple at that time and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The fullness of the spirit was upon Jesus. Why? To bring good news to the poor. (laughs) To bring freedom to the captive. To bring recovery of sight to the blind in the acceptable year of the Lord. And he says, now is this fulfilled this day. So there, back 2,000 years ago, this fulfillment, this restoration began in Jesus of all the promises that we read in Joel. 
And it continues on. No, Jesus went to the cross. He died on the cross. You know, the restoration process, <laughs> there's some work, there's some pain, there's some struggle, there's some difficulty, there's some involved in that restoration process. There is a cross to bear. Jesus himself, God himself, went to the cross, died on the cross in order that we might know restoration in the midst of our pain, in the midst of the negative things that have happened in our life or the negative things we've inherited from our forebears. And here Jesus rose again to demonstrate that resurrection life is available to us today if we simply give our life to Christ, receive him as our saviour, the Spirit comes into our life. <laughs> that promise of Joel begins, the Holy Spirit. We receive the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God enables us to walk a new path and start a new journey and begin a new legacy that we pass on to, our four, to our, those who follow us. And then we read on, if we come to the book of Acts, you know, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, here in the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus are gathered together. Those who heard Jesus' words and were following in Jesus' way, his disciples, they are gathered together in an upper room and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them in the fullness. And here they had amazing things happen, tongues of fire and they, they spoke in spiritual languages which they didn't even know. There's amazing miracles happen as the Holy Spirit was poured out. And Peter stood up and said, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now, today, in this place, God is pouring out his Spirit. And that's what I want to say to us. Now, today, in this place the Holy Spirit continues to be available he is here in this place right now and when we walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit it's not just a blessing for us it's so that we as God's people walking in the power of the Holy Spirit can be also like Jesus was people who bring restoration who bring recovery of sight to the blind for those of you in the medical area what an awesome privilege it is to do that who bring freedom to the captive for those who minister to people who are bound up and broken we can bring that that deliverance and that new legacy now even in today amongst the people and the people that we minister to we can bring that legacy and we can minister and pass it on to future generations because we are Jesus hands and feet now somehow he has engaged us in this process of passing on that spiritual legacy that God has given us we can all begin a new generation and pass on a new legacy in Jesus is that good news I think it's amazing news I think it's awesome news so having settled that, that whatever our past might have been, whatever our legacy might have been, we can begin a new legacy. Now let's reflect on, in the remaining time we have together, what is the legacy, what is the best legacy that we can pass on? What is in our tackle box? What is it that we are going to pass on to our children and our children's children? What a great thing to reflect on on Father's Day <laughs> as fathers and as parents and as aunts and uncles. What are we passing on, not just to our children, but to our children's tr children? Why don't you think about it? Why don't you think about a person, an older person, who had a significant impact, a positive impact in your life? They could still be alive or they could have gone to be with Jesus. But just reflect and choose one person. Think of one person. Okay, have you thought of that one person? Now think about what was the gift, what was the most, there might be a number of gifts they gave you, but what was the most significant gift they passed on to you, which had that positive impact and influence in your life. Now, if you've thought of it, say hallelujah. If you haven't thought of it yet, say, oh, no. Okay, so nobody said, oh, no. So I think that means we're ready to go. Let me ask you, how many of you it was they gave you a huge amount of money? Anybody? That's fine if they did, and maybe that would have been a tremendous blessing. Was there anybody that was the case? Let me tell you, my mum and dad did not pass on to me a huge amount of money. <laughs> I think they passed on to me something far better than that. <laughs> for how many of you, for that person, was the gift that they gave you a skill they taught, taught you? Maybe you know, learning how to fish, learning how to ride a bike, learning how to read, learning how to do something practical, learning how to be a carpenter or something. It was a skill, and that, this is, that, that, that's a good thing. How many of you, it was a skill? Okay, so for some of you, it was a skill. You've lifted your hand, and that's a precious gift to pass on to you, but not for most of you. Let me ask you, for how many of you, it was a value? It was something like the love that they expressed to you. It was the kindness they showed to you. It was the, the life that they lived, which was an example for you to follow. For how many of you, that's what they, the gift that they gave to you? Look at that. That's most hands going up. 
Now, I've done a similar exercise to this in leadership training. I did it in India in an orphanage just recently, and every time the response is exactly the same. The thing that we mostly remember, whatever culture, wherever we are, what we mostly remember is the character qualities that are passed on. And the Bible actually reflects on this and says this, because if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, we realize what are the values that remain. What are the things that remain? 1 Corinthians 13 is this awesome scripture about love. They had it at my mum's funeral, had it at my dad's funeral. They often do it at weddings. It's a well-loved scripture talking about love is patient, love is kind. But right at the end, there's this really telling phrase where it says, and now these three remain. Other, scripture, other versions say, and now these three, these three things abide. They remain. They have permanence. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. And what's the greatest one? Love. So these are the things which have eternal value, which will last. These are, the, if you want to know what, what's the best thing I can pass on to my children and to my children's children, this is it. Far, I mean, I'd love to receive a million dollars from my parents, but far greater than that from my parents and from my grandparents, I received faith, hope, and love. And that's a legacy, even if we didn't receive that from my parents. That is a legacy that we can pass on to our children and our children's children, which will last and remain right through eternity. Those, those have eternal value. So I want to reflect for a little bit on these three aspects. First of all, what are they? Well, they're not rules. I mean, it's good to have a rule about how to love people, and maybe a, but they're more guidelines. You can have some guidelines about how to love, but unless you actually put them into practice and they become a part of who you are, they, they don't have eternal value. They're not even higher principles or you know, high duties that we should follow because if they just remain high principles and du high duties and they don't actually transform our hearts and minds, then they don't have eternal value. It's when faith, hope, and love transform our hearts and minds and become character qualities, deeply embedded character qualities in their life. That's that example which then resonates through generations after generations of generations and has eternal impact. So faith, hope, and love are character qualities. If you like their, their character qualities, and I, I like this quote, um, their character qualities which are forged in the fire of life, hammered out on the anvil of grace, and fashioned by the blacksmith of love. It takes a little bit of work to exercise faith. It takes a little bit of work to a labor of love. It takes a little bit of work to to continue to hold on to hope when everything seems contradictory. So there's work involved in that. But you say, isn't it God who works in us? Yes, God works in us. We are God's workmanship. When we come to Christ, we receive the Spirit. The Holy Spirit begins to transform us. But then we respond to that. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we have a work to do. He creates us. He forms us. He fashions us. But then we have a work of love to do. We have a work, a labor of faith to do. We have to be strong in hope. And so as we work on these things through our life, as we sometimes fail and we get back up again and say, God, forgive me. I'm going to have another go. And then we work on that through the, all of the thousands of little decisions we make over our life. Something is fashioned in the core of our being. Character is fashioned. Faith, hope, and love is formed deep in the fire of life by the blacksmith of love on the anvil of grace. And that's what we have to pass on. A life of following Christ in faith, hope, and love. So let me now briefly illustrate each of these looking to some of our forebears. Now some of you, your forebears are from places like Iran or places like Vietnam or places like India or places like Malaysia and China and so you have an amazing history. You know, did you know all of us here are migrants? We're all refugees in a sense. <laughs> I mean, there are some indigenous people who've been here for many, many thousands of years and uh, you know, I want to acknowledge that. But nevertheless, for most of us here, we're all come, either us or our fathers or our forebears have come to as migrants and refugees. And so we can look back to them and there's things we can learn from our forebears. So I want to reflect on this looking at my own cultural past. And let's look at this whole area of the legacy of hope. We'll begin with that, legacy of hope. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, Paul repeats these three about uh, faith, hope, and love, but he points out that they are a work, they are a labor. So let's just have that scripture coming up on here. And we're going to particularly look at this whole area of steadfastness of hope and then shortly we'll look at labor of love and then we'll look at work of faith. So these are things that character qualities which need to be worked into our life. 
Now think about our forebears who came as migrants and refugees and settlers to these shores. They came in hope. They came believing that as they came, they would begin a new legacy and a new generation that would hand on something better to, their, to those who followed, to their children and to their children's children. I mean, we think of Australia's history as being you know, convicts coming to Australia after you know, the, the, the indigenous people of Australia and then the convicts came. But that was only a small part of Australia's history. Even in the 1800s, from my forebears in Australia and New Zealand, most of the people who came were people who came freely because they wanted a better life for their children. They came out of famine. They came out of poverty. They came out of brokenness. They came out of even prison at time in order to find a new hope and a new destiny and a new legacy for their children and their children's children. I'm a bit of a history buff. I've researched some of these things. And let me tell you about one particular gentleman. His name was Crookshank. Can you say Crookshank? So Crookshank was a young man in Edinburgh, and uh, his father had died when he was one years old. His father, Benjamin, had actually been thrown into prison because he owed a debt of 64 pounds to the city council. And there in prison, his father developed emphysema in a small town outside Edinburgh in Scotland, and his father, Benjamin, died. And just a year after that, his mother died as well. And because they had nothing, absolutely nothing, not even to buy a headstone, they were buried in the footpath of the local church because they didn't even have money to pay for a grave digger. And that happened with many people in Scotland who were, died in poverty around about that era. Nevertheless, you know, there are multiple revivals in Scotland during that time. John Wesley, about 90 years before, had preached. There had been uh, others who'd come, and there'd been people who'd come to Christ and come to know faith in Jesus Christ, and there was a strong faith within those communities. So my, uh, so it's Crookshanks, was family was gathered up and they were sent to various places and Crookshank grew up in the slums of Edinburgh in a small room where around about 16 people lived in the small room but he, he wanted something better he had a hope and he had a dream he became a merchant seaman he sailed the world on those huge clipper ships with the big sails all around the world and one of his sisters actually migrated to Dunedin in New Zealand and he was writing to her regularly now Dunedin was a settlement by Christians who wanted a freedom of expression in their worship and in the governance of their church. So they migrated from Scotland to Dunedin, which literally means Edinburgh, <laughs> and they started a whole new Christian community there in Edinburgh. And Crookshank was writing to his sister Marion, and he was getting a bit sick of the seafaring life. And so he says, when I get to Dunedin, I'm going to jump ship, make sure someone's there to pick me up. He got to Dunedin in his ship. He jumped over at midnight, apparently. He was picked up by his brother-in-law, and he started a whole new life and a whole new legacy and a whole new era in Dunedin. Now, Crookshank's full name was Andrew Crookshank Chisholm. He's my great-granddad. <laughs> so I know this history. And I know that that family, like so many families and so many migrants at that time, would have prayed the Lord's Prayer regularly around the dinner table. They would have prayed the Lord's Prayer regularly on Sunday. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, they had an expectation of the kingdom of earth, not just for the future, but they had an expectation of justice and mercy and hope and deliverance and kindness and all those things. They were, felt as though they were ones who were carrying that legacy and they actually believed that they could live it out. They lived a legacy of hope out to pass on to future generations because of their faith in Christ as their Lord and Saviour. They prayed it regularly. And I know that my great-grandfather, Andrew Crookshank Chisholm, he left a legacy for his, for his children, his children's children. I read his obituary. read about his life. Two of his children became ministers in the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand, ministers of the gospel. One of his children became a magistrate. Two of his children started an orphanage for people who were orphans. One of his child children became a captain or an officer in the army. He left a legacy of his children. But we read in his obituary, all of his children were followers of Jesus. All of his children served in the local church in various ways. He'd started a whole new generation out of brokenness and loss. And he's left me a legacy of hope, <laughs> a legacy of hope in Jesus that we can all start a new generation. What about a legacy of faith? <laughs> 
It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, 3 that we need to have a, a work of faith. You know, faith is something you've got to work at. Sometimes we know we, we doubt and we're not quite sure. We're not quite sure. Can we really trust God? But as we come to the Word of God, as we have a rhythm of the Word and a rhythm of prayer and read the Word of God, and as we work at that and labor at that and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, faith grows in our heart. And the Bible tells us, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Let me tell you about another of my forebears. Photos coming up right now on the slide here. If you look on the far right side of the next slide, you'll see a picture of my grandfather, Andrew Robert Chisholm. This is one of the sons of Crookshank, okay? Here he is, he's got a collar on. My, <laughs> my mum asked me when I came over to see her just three weeks ago, where's your collar, Andrew? I was wondering, what, what is she talking about? Because now, now I'm senior minister, so they expect, she expected me to be wearing a collar. Because, anyway, so here's my grandfather, Andrew Chisholm. Now, he, at 35 years of age, he was a carpenter, an itinerant carpenter, going around trying to find whatever work he could in, in a depressed New Zealand economy in the early 1900s. And he, he felt the call of God to go and be a missionary to the Maori, the indigenous people of, of New Zealand. And so he went with no education. He went to Bible Theological College. He studied three years at the Theological College, and at 39, he went out to be a missionary. When he was there in the Northern Ireland, though, he, was in, he had captured flu in a flu epidemic, and because of that, he permanently had asthma and could not breathe very well because there's no ventilin to relieve that. So the Presbyterian Church gave him a smaller assignment in a small church in a place called Cromwell, which is right near Queenstown. And there, year after year, during the Depression years, when they didn't have very much money at all, he continued to minister the Word of God to that congregation. This is my tackle box, if you like, from my grandfather, Andrew Robert Chisholm. And in this tackle box, what it has is a whole copy of his sermons, multiple, multiple ones of his sermons. <laughs> all, I've read them. All sermons where he preaches the gospel. Here's his Bible that he most probably preached from. This is the legacy that he's handed on to me, a legacy of faith in the Word of God. Let me read you some of the things he preached in August 1936. He is with us today. He is living in me. Jesus is no dim finger of history, no shadow of our ideal. He is not a man of Galilee and Nazareth any longer. But today in London, Paris, New Zealand and Cromwell, he lives in you and he lives in me. Isn't that a confession of faith? Let me tell you, today, Jesus lives in you, and he lives in me. We have the hope of a future. We have a legacy of faith that we can pass on to others. So my grandfather gave me, passed on to me a legacy of faith. That young lad there standing at the back, that's my dad. I might talk about him a little bit another time. But this is the thing I want to, know to, I want to tell you. My dad, he left me a legacy of love. He was a very busy man. He was a doctor. He was a missionary in India and all that. Very, very busy man. But I never doubted that he loved me. At Christmas and at my birthdays and at other random times, he'd send me cards or he'd call me and tell me how much he loved and appreciated me. Let me finish this message by just reflecting on this whole thing of how do, how do we communicate love to a coming generation? How do we pass on that deep love, that legacy of love to a coming generation? A practical way of doing that is actually to write a note, send an email, send a text message. Tell someone who's younger than you, maybe a, a nephew or a niece if you don't have children yourself, or maybe just someone who you've ministered to when you're in children's church, or someone you know, one of these children up here, send them a note, send them a letter. You know, back in 1985, it's a very, very powerful story. There was an airline crash. Flight 123, Japan Airlines en route to Osaka, had 524 passengers on board. In his book, The Blessing, Gary Smalley retells this story. As this plane is crashing to earth, and it takes 30 minutes, it was spinning round and round and round as the pilot struggled to maintain control, a number of these Japanese men and women wrote small notes to their family. That's the last thing they were thinking of, their family. One of them, Kazuo Yoshimura, said, please live bravely, please look after the children. What power that is to write a note to your family in your last, in your last dying moments. Hiratsugu Kawagushi, as the plane was spinning round and round, just composed a seven-page letter to his family. He wrote, 
I'm very sad, I'm sure I won't make it. The plane is rolling round and round and descending rapidly. There is something like an explosion that has triggered smoke. You, Shosh, my oldest son, I'm counting on you. You and the other children be good to each other and work hard. Remember to help your mother. Kaiko, that was his wife. Take good care of yourself. I'm always moved by this. To think our dinner last night was our last. I'm grateful for the truly happy life I have enjoyed. That's the legacy he passed on to his children. They still have that letter. That family, still today, it's been passed on through generation and generation. What's the legacy we're passing on? Now, Greg Vaughan, when he opened that tackle box and God spoke to him, he felt really challenged that he needed to start a new generation. And as God challenged him, what's in your tackle box? He decided he'd start a ministry, and he called that ministry Letters from Dad. And through that ministry, he encouraged thousands of dads all around the world to take a step and write a letter to your children. Tell them how much you love them. Write a letter to your your nieces and your your, your cousins and What a practical way. What a practical guideline. There may be other things that you can think of you can do, but here on Father's Day, why don't we all take a step to pass on a legacy to the other generations, to our children's children? And one really practical way of doing that is just write a note of encouragement to all all of those of another generation in our community. Young people singing up here, the thousand or so children is it in the children's church there delicate i mean i mean let's encourage them let's bless them let's 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 tell them and let's communicate to them faith hope and love and the future that they have in jesus christ